Okay, hi everybody. Uh, today um, we're very happy to have uh, uh, Dan Capetz as our speaker uh, from Harvard, and he will tell us about the Kerr black hole as a quantum system. Please, Dan. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you, Shahar, for the invitation uh, to speak at this seminar. Um, yeah, so I'm going to discuss some quantum mechanical aspects of the Kerr black hole. I was told that this is an audience with kind of a broad uh, range of interests and expertise. So I tried to uh, make it accessible uh, to most people with background and gravity. So I apologize to the experts if some of this will seem a little bit basic. So this is sort of what I'd like to cover. I'm going to start with sort of a very uh, quick overview of black hole thermodynamics and then specialize uh, to what are probably the most interesting class of black holes, near extremal cold black holes, and discuss a little bit about their quantum mechanics and uh, thermodynamics. There are a couple of old puzzles uh, for these black holes that have been around since the early 90s. Uh, and the main uh, sort of result that I'll discuss is a new calculation, some new results on the low temperature thermodynamics for asymptotically flat black holes uh, that resolves some of those older puzzles. So this uh, is going to be talk based primarily on this paper, which came out late last year. And if you're interested, there was also a, a paper which did basically the same calculation and appeared about a week after ours uh, that agreed uh, with the answer. Okay. Okay. So just like a very brief motivation for this. Uh, the subject, you know, I'm sure everybody knows that about 50 years ago, physicists working on general relativity stumbled into a very powerful formal analogy between the behavior of black holes and general relativity on one hand and the laws of thermodynamics, uh, which we've known for hundreds of years. And that analogy turned out to be extremely powerful, and it still really drives much of the work on quantum gravity uh, today. And it's probably fair to say that it's really responsible for a lot of progress in the field. And you know, the reason that that's the case is that we know that the laws of thermodynamics, they're not really fundamental laws of nature. Rather, they have some statistical microscopic origin. In other words, they emerge from other more fundamental laws of nature whose dynamics is complex, ergodic, mixing, etc. Okay, so you know, thermodynamics is some sort of coarse-grained approximation to underlying uh, natural laws. And we have a lot of evidence that the geometric black hole entropy also has a microscopic quantum mechanical origin. Uh, but on the other hand, the black hole is just curvature in space time. So if you understand how it is that black hole thermodynamics arises from the statistical mechanics of a quantum system, then you understand what it means in some sense for space time to emerge from quantum mechanics. And that's sort of the, the key piece which many people believe is necessary in order to to understand a consistent quantum gravitational model. There's a lot of evidence that space-time is sort of an emergent concept, and this is sort of the place where that idea is, is front and center. Also, please interrupt me with questions at, at any time. I prefer sort of informal interaction. OK, so just a very quick review. You know that there's a very short list of black holes uh, in four so dimensions. You're saying that we can't, there is no way to calculate 
when a1 equal in the same way she did yes she did when we put the dependence of of the metric in time in this coordinate in x y z um sorry i'm not sure if i understood the question but but the same but the physics should be the same uh Yeah, so far I, I'm just saying that you know if if the uh, thermodynamic properties that we so, understand. So you about, can do it, and the, so you can do it with the time dependence coordinate in the spherical case. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm suggesting that maybe Ayoshi will did it in in with the time coordinate dependence in the radial case. And we will learn from it what we should do in order for the to get the same physical result in the time dependent yeah, case. You did it, Marav. So how, I think you need to uh, to mute. To okay. mute. Okay. And then. Uh, All right. Uh, yeah, I'm not sorry. Sure. Sorry about that. That's good for me or maybe for someone else. Um, okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. It was for someone else probably. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so there's a very short list of black holes in 4D general relativity. If you have spherical symmetry, it's Schwarzschild and Reissner Nordstrom. If you have axial symmetry, it's Kerr or Kerr Newman. They're labeled by a small number of parameters, mass, charge, and spin, and they're all static or stationary, which means they're like equilibrium states. And because those black holes come in families, the black holes that are close to each other obey some balance relations. So everybody, I think, is probably familiar with this formula that relates the mass, area, angular momentum, and charge of nearby black holes uh, in terms of the surface gravity, angular velocity of the horizon, and chemical potential if there are gauge fields. So that's obviously a formula which looks very similar to a law of thermodynamics, but it's completely geometrical. It's a, just a consequence of the classical Einstein equation. And in general formulas of this type, really they just rely on diffeomorphism invariance. But in particular, there's no H bar in that formula. And we also know that the surface gravity kappa is constant on the horizon in the area of the event horizon increases under classical evolution. So those are three facts um, which are extremely similar to the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, but even with that observation, it was a little bit puzzling what the temperature would mean uh, in that system. So temperature is usually some parameter that characterizes when two systems are in thermal equilibrium, sort of a phenomenological parameter, and if we consider an open system at temperature T, then usually um, if it's in contact with the vacuum, then the temperature will just control the spectrum of emitted radiation. But of course, the black hole was black, and by definition, nothing comes out, so it's not really clear how powerful this analogy was. If it was anything more than just a formal uh, analogy. And moreover, the combination that appears in that First law of black hole mechanics, TDS, does not uniquely fix the scale of the temperature or the entropy. So you could freely scale either one of them and leave the form of the formula untouched. So it wasn't clear actually even what temperature or entropy to assign uh, to the black hole. Now, of course, the status of that analogy changed dramatically with the paper uh, by Stephen Hawking, who considered the quantum fields propagating on a fixed black hole background, and he demonstrated um, with all the factors in place that a far observer does receive faint radiation from the black hole. Okay, and In particular, that allowed him to fix the coefficient between the temperature and the entropy. And importantly, the temperature Temperature turns out to be proportional to H bar, and the entropy is inversely proportional uh, to H bar. So the quantity TDS, as we expected, doesn't have any dependence on quantum mechanics. It cancels out uh, of the general relativity answer. 
But in the classical limit, the temperature vanishes and the entropy becomes infinite. And the black hole really is black. Okay, so it's taken to be sort of an important clue that for finite h bar, the entropy is both finite, meaning that you expect some discrete, uh, some discrete set of energy eigenstates that describe the system, and that it scales with the area rather than the volume of the black hole. Because if you took a random sort of generic thermal state in a local quantum mechanical model, you would expect uh, the entropy to scale like volume instead of area. So there seems to be an indication that there's some dramatic reduction in the number of effective degrees of freedom uh, in highly complex quantum gravitational states. So there are many different ways of deriving this result. It's really just a result in quantum field theory, and quantum field theory is on pretty strong mathematical footing compared to quantum gravity. Um, but the analog of this effect in quantum gravity leads to a pretty dramatic puzzle, and that's because when gravity is dynamical, you expect that the black hole will shrink as it radiates, and it'll eventually disappear. But Hawking showed that the radiation is approximately thermal, and so far nobody really has any quantitative description of how the information gets out of the black hole in time to purify uh, the radiation out near null and infinity. Okay, so that's the information loss puzzle. It's been around for 50 years, and there's a tremendous amount of work on it. Um, the approaches to this problem sort of fall into two broad categories. And I'll discuss both of them because I'm only going to follow one of these approaches. So the first sort of more conservative approach uh, is sort of less ambitious, just tries to identify the quantum system dual to the black hole. So that started with some famous work of Strominger and Waffa in the mid 1990s and eventually morphed into the ADS CFT correspondence. There's lots of progress on this part of the problem. Uh, and the calculations tend to be pretty uncontroversial because they can be made uh, relatively mathematically precise. Um, but this approach is really only possible in situations where the black hole either is not evaporating or the evaporation can be ignored uh, in some sense. So for instance, for large black holes, in anti de Sitter space, which are able to come into thermal equilibrium with their radiation, or for supersymmetric black holes, uh, which simply don't evaporate. Okay. The more ambitious and ultimately more interesting uh, part of this problem is to understand how the black hole actually stores and releases information. So that's obviously a much harder problem. It requires you to actually understand the dynamics, and because of that, calculations uh, in this approach tend to be more controversial, because ultimately, since we don't have a complete technical understanding of all of the dynamics uh, in quantum gravity, you end up having to make some assumptions to even get started, and of course, uh, inevitably, you will end up arguing about assumptions. So there has been, I would say, quite a bit of progress on this part of the problem in the last several years. Um, but the, the part that I'm going to discuss for the Kerr black hole is really this kind of simpler and a little bit more tractable part of the question. Okay, so you know, splitting the problem up in this way is a little bit like trying to study the spectrum of an atom separately before you couple it to the quantized electromagnetic field, okay? So we imagine we have a Hamiltonian for an atom, a Hamiltonian for photons, and some small coupling between them. You know that generic excited states uh, of the atom are going to become resonances once they couple to the electromagnetic field. And the fact that they are resonances is the analog sort of of the, uh, the information puzzle for black holes, right? It's the fact that Black holes are not actually eigenstates, they decay, and they have a lot of information which doesn't seem to get out. 
right? So, but the normal way to study a problem like this is to sort of first try to understand the discrete spectrum of bound states in the atom before you couple it uh, to the electromagnetic field. Once you get a handle on this part of the problem, then you treat this as some small perturbation and, and understand the dynamics. And that's what we'd like to try to do uh, for the black hole problem. So sort of as a cartoon, you'd imagine that there's some sort of black hole Hamiltonian, which controls this discrete uh, number of states associated to the black hole. There's some Hamiltonian for the far region. The spectrum is pretty simple. It's just, you know, weakly interacting gravitons, photons, fermions, that sort of thing. And then there's some coupling between the near region of the black hole and the far region, which tells us how the black hole uh, interacts with its environment. And so we expect this Hamiltonian to be extremely complicated, chaotic. This one is probably pretty simple. Uh, and so this is the one which kind of we have the hardest time understanding and the one that we're going to focus on. Okay, so this is just kind of a, an artist's rendition of, of what I just said. But if you're curious, this is the, uh, this is ChatGPT's version of an isometric embedding of the, the Schwarzschild black hole. Um, so not quite right, but it's close enough for government work. So the idea is that we have some discrete system, very complicated to understand, densely packed eigenvalues associated to the black hole, far region, which is pretty simple. We know how to solve everything there. And then there's some sort of coupling between the two regions, um, which introduces interesting dynamics. Now, one of the main difficulties in this area is there really isn't a diffeomorphism invariant way to split the Hamiltonian like this in quantum gravity. So diffeomorphism invariance tells you uh, that the sum of these three Hamiltonians is actually just a boundary term out of spatial infinity. There's no sort of local meaning to uh, energy in gravity. <clears throat> and, and that's, you know, that's sort of a clue in, in terms of potential holographic formulations of quantum gravity, but it makes uh, this cartoon a little bit more difficult to think about. That, <clears throat> so that, Dan, um, question. Uh, so are you suggesting to think about this uh, split into three parts, also as a split in space time? So like the, is H black hole kind of like the near horizon region and the coupling is the- Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I'm going to discuss. I mean, there's a, there's a particular limit in which we know that is actually there's a geometric realization of this split, and that's the near extremal limit. In general, for black holes far from extremality, I think it's really not clear how, how this split is supposed to be done. And that's why really much less is known about black holes far from extremality. But I think sort of for a cartoon in the back of the mind, the, the coupling really is kind of, it's somehow associated to this region where the far region is kind of, you know, talking to the, the near region of of the black hole, but it's yeah, as you say, it's not guaranteed that you can sort of think of it in geometrically. You might have to think of it in phase space, something more complicated for sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, but so even even when we have a decomposition like this, it's usually the case that the the coupling between the black hole region and the far region just can't be ignored. And that complicates the problem. As I just mentioned, uh, what happened in the late 90s is that people found a particular limit for a particular class of black holes where this coupling term really is small and could be ignored for most purposes. And that eventually turned into the ADS-CFT duality. So this technique really made it possible for the first time to explicitly identify the quantum systems dual to certain black holes or really it was more about black brains at the time. Uh, and because the systems that were encountered were known to be completely unitary and perfectly well-defined, I think most experts sort of updated their priors strongly in favor of unitarity, even though to this day, we still don't really understand the evaporation process on a technical level. <clears throat> so, you know, th these examples that were discussed in the late 90s 
They all came from string theory, and the quantum systems were low energy, non gravitational limits of strings and brains. There was a lot of technical baggage that was coming along for the ride. But what I want to emphasize is just that that was really just an illustration of an idea that we actually believe holds more generally, even when we can't explicitly construct the quantum system. So we believed that black holes uh, should have some description in terms of highly chaotic uh, quantum states. Uh, people learned how, in particular models of quantum gravity, to explicitly construct those states within string theory. Um, but you know, that's just a particular instantiation of an idea that we think holds uh, for black holes, regardless of whether string theory is actually related uh, to the physical universe. And in particular, this is going to be the case for Kerr, because after several decades of work, we still don't have any sort of microscopic construction uh, from the top down of the four-dimensional Kerr black hole. Now, we still try to understand what we can know about its quantum mechanics without having such a top-down construction. Okay, are there any questions before I uh, specialize to the near extremal case? Okay, great. So, as you know, when there are multiple parameters uh, in a family of black hole solutions, the existence of the horizon usually imposes a bound on the charges. The black hole can't spin too fast or have too much charge, otherwise the horizon disappears and there's a naked singularity in the solution. And they're sort of plausible mathematical demonstrations that no process can overspin or overcharge the black hole, but it is thought that you can get sort of arbitrarily close, or at least close enough to observe some spectacular effects. So the black holes that nearly saturate these charges, these uh, bounds, are usually called near extremal. And as the black hole is dialed towards extremality, so if you spin it up at fixed mass or charge it up at fixed mass, a deep throat-like region develops right outside of the horizon. So an observer far from the black hole doesn't really see anything special in that region uh, right outside of the horizon. He kind of has to work hard just to, uh, to see signatures of this huge region. Um, but an observer near the black hole who's sort of co-rotating with the horizon basically experiences a whole little mini universe all to himself. So this was understood very early on in studies of the Kerr black hole. And this is sort of still sort of one of the uh, best cartoons to visualize what's happening. They've sort of labeled a couple of interesting astrophysical radii and Hoyer Lindquist coordinates here. And you can see as you spin the black hole up closer and closer to extremality, this throat develops sort of a divergent proper depth. And the geometry begins to look approximately like ADS2. <clears throat> okay. So in this very special limit, where you uh, spin the black hole up uh, towards extremality, the space-time is effectively bifurcating into two separate systems, which are approximately decoupled. Uh, so you know, the idea is to sort of associate this ADS2 region to the black hole. And we expect that to be controlled by this black hole Hamiltonian in some sense. And the region outside of the horizon, which seems infinitely far away to an observer in the throat, uh, we would just replace that with the boundary of ADS2. Okay? So the boundary of ADS2 for the observer near the black hole kind of represents the far region. And to the observer in the far region, the boundary of ADS2 kind of represents the stretched time-like horizon of the near extremal black hole. Okay. If we had taken a limit of uh, near extremal black brains rather than black holes, you just get higher dimensional hyperbolic space. So the near extremal black hole is sort of a, a soliton that's interpolating between two uh, very symmetric solutions to general relativity. The one in the far region, which is just flat space, and the one in the near region, uh, which is hyperbolic space with compact extra dimensions. Okay, so the original idea that sort of led to the ADS CFT correspondence yeah, was. Can I ask a question? Sure, absolutely. Go ahead. 
what is the black brain? Yeah, so those are solutions in uh, higher dimensional gravity where the horizon just has um, in sort of a non-compact rather than a, a compact spherical uh, horizon. They're just sort of higher dimensional versions of black holes. So they have higher dimensional world volumes. So kind of one of the most studied examples would be a, a three brain and supergravity. That's sort of a four dimensional space time object. And so the quantum field theories that describe their low energy dynamics are you know, four dimensional quantum field theories rather than one dimensional quantum mechanical systems. So it's just, it's like, it's an object with the horizon, but uh, with more uh, sort of ways that you can move along it. Does that make sense? You can think of an actual membrane, right? So if you think of a black hole sort of as like a point surrounded by spherical horizon, you know, a black brain would be more like a membrane. So it just has more, uh, more directions associated to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. But anyway, we'll only discuss black holes. That's sort of more of a historical. So the, the original idea that led to the ADS-CO2 correspondence was to try to understand the response of the black hole to low energy probes, but sort of in two different ways. So, you know, we're essentially doing kind of some kind of black hole spectroscopy. We shoot things in at the black hole from null infinity. We wait for a while and see what comes back out, right? Now, there's one geometric way to do this calculation, which is just to wait until the stuff propagates close enough to the black hole and enters the throat. Then you just replace those uh, probes with boundary conditions at the boundary of the ADS2 throat, do a calculation in ADS2, and then match back onto the far region to calculate uh, what the far observer sees. Okay. So that's just an exercise in matched asymptotic expansions in general relativity. Okay. But you know, if what we believe to be true is true, then there should be another way to do that calculation. So if the black hole really is a quantum mechanical system and the dynamics is really occurring right outside of the black hole, uh, then we should be able to calculate this type of scattering process by studying the response of the quantum system to these sources, which we're probing the black hole with, okay? And in the best understood examples, we actually can do the calculation in both ways and they match. And that's sort of the best evidence that we have for the ADS-CFT correspondence. And in the cases where we don't really understand the quantum mechanics that well, uh, we use this idea to try to learn about the quantum mechanics of the black hole. So we imagine scattering off of the care black hole and try to imagine what type of quantum mechanical system could produce the response function that we calculate uh, using gravitational techniques. And this, this is the, the, the crux of the ADS-CFT correspondence because the, the CFT in ADS-CFT is the quantum mechanics that describes the black hole or the black brain. And ADS uh, is just the dynamics in this throat region right outside of the near extremal black hole. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, in those examples that were understood in the 90s, knowing the quantum mechanical system allowed people to actually give a statistical interpretation for the black hole entropy. So E to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy really was just the number of states in a quantum mechanical system and that corresponded to these black hole solutions. Now, strictly speaking, because the black hole was extremal, meaning zero temperature, really what was being counted were the ground states in the quantum mechanics. Okay. So, you know, if you think about calculating a partition function as a function of temperature, when you take the temperature to zero, the number that you get just tells you how many ground states do you have in the system. And these extremal black holes or black holes in general relativity, they have this funny 
uh, thermodynamic property that when you take the temperature to zero, there's still a huge macroscopic uh, entropy left, which means that there's some huge number of degenerate ground states in the system. And that's pretty peculiar thermodynamic behavior. It usually doesn't happen in quantum systems unless there's some symmetry that protects this huge degeneracy. Now, in, in the cases that were understood exactly, there was extra symmetry, there was supersymmetry, which was inherited from the superstring, and that supersymmetry protected the degeneracy. So it wasn't a huge surprise there that there were a lot of ground states in these quantum systems describing the black hole because supersymmetric systems, uh, they can just generically have a lot of ground states. But it is impossible to make uh, the 4D care black hole supersymmetric. Um, and yet the sort of leading order Bekenstein-Hawking calculation predicts a huge ground state degeneracy for these systems. So the kind of first question that you'd like to understand is do quantum corrections lift this ground state degeneracy? Is this huge degeneracy just an artifact of the leading order calculation? Does the next correction to the calculation lift them, spread them out in some dense energy band right above the vacuum, for instance? Okay, and there's another uh, sort of related puzzle regarding the low temperature thermodynamics of the air black hole, which is that if you calculate what is the energy available to the black hole above extremality, you'll find that it scales quadratically with the temperature of the black hole. On the other hand, the typical energy of a Hawking quantum scales linearly with T. So, you know, if you have a quadratic and a linear function, they're going to intersect somewhere. And below this intersection point, uh, you know, a typical single Hawking quantum is going to carry away all of the thermodynamically available energy of the black hole. So it's really not an equilibrium process in any sense. There's no adiabatic change. It's taking basically all of the free energy of the black hole away during the emission process. And so that's a puzzle. It, it means basically that you can't trust the thermodynamic uh, answers that you're getting below this intersection point. Uh, another way to, to describe this point is just as the point at which the statistical fluctuations controlled by things like the specific heat become very large. Okay, so you actually need to do a more detailed calculation to understand what happens at temperatures below this point. Okay, and this was understood, you know, roughly 30 years ago. Dan, just to understand when you were saying available energy, I mean, uh, you're referring to the free energy here? Or? So you, you just calculate uh, the energy, which is like a derivative with respect to beta of the partition function and subtract from that the mass of the black hole basically. So it's like the energy above uh, extremality in, in this ensemble. <laughs> okay, so these authors identified that problem. They knew that there was uh, something very subtle about the statistical mechanics of black holes at this uh, low temperature, but they weren't able to do a calculation which really nailed down um, what the actual dynamics is. So there's there's different ways that this issue could be resolved. There could be that there was just a gap in the energy spectrum of the black hole. And if you have a huge gap in the spectrum, you obviously can't apply thermodynamics below that gap because there's just not enough states to apply statistical mechanics to. So that was one option, or it could have just been uh, that there are large quantum corrections to the leading order of thermodynamic calculation uh, and that this plot actually gets corrected. And we'll see that that turns out to be what happens uh, for the near extreme of care black hole. Okay, so just to, to expand on that a little bit more, we know that the black hole thermodynamics is some sort of force grain. Thermodynamics is always force graining of some sort of microscopic uh, system. We don't know the exact density of states of the black hole. The Bekenstein-Hawking formula gives us sort of the smooth approximation to it. So we know roughly how many states there are supposed to be 
in an energy band. That's controlled uh, by the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, but we don't know where all the little points in the energy spectrum are. So if you imagine this, this little comb telling you all the different eigenstates for the black hole Hamiltonian, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy tells us roughly how many of them are in the band. If we do some correction, you know, we'll get a better approximation to where the different eigenstates are, but you really need to go uh, deep into the corrections to actually start to narrow down, you know, this eigenstate sits right here, this one sits right here. And really the the leading calculation that comes from general relativity is more coarse than all of this, right? So, you know, it could be that the leading order of Bekenstein Hawking answer says there's a big degeneracy at, uh, you know, at zero energy above extremality. Uh, but when you actually calculate all the corrections, you see that they get spread out uh, into a dense energy band right above the vacuum because you just can't resolve these little spacings with the leading order calculation. Okay, so what, what we've done in this project is just to compute sort of the leading quantum correction, which seems to be important for this low temperature uh, black hole. And the answer that we got appropriately interpreted seems to say that the ground state degeneracy really is lifted for the near extremal care black holes. And the way to see that is just that in this approximation, the density of states actually vanishes at zero energy. So we can't say that there are no states degenerate sitting uh, at zero energy, but we do know that the number of them is sub-exponential in the extremal Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. So there might be some, but not a lot. Uh, and to determine actually how many they are, you would have to do a much more precise calculation and get the actual energy splittings Correct, that's basically impossible in using gravitational uh, techniques, but sort of the physics seems to be clear that uh, sort of the, the big degeneracy for Kerr is an artifact of the leading order calculation. If you include the important quantum corrections, you'll find actually that all of those ground states get spread out uh, in a dense energy band above the vacuum. And moreover, you'll find if you calculate the correction to the low temperature, thermodynamics, that the uh, sort of available energy above extremality picks up a piece which is linear uh, in the temperature, so that the curve for the black hole is actually always above the curve for the Hawking radiation, which means that you actually can still continue to apply thermodynamics in this band right above zero energy. So basically what happens is because all of these ground states is spread out above the vacuum. Now you do have many states to which you can apply statistical mechanics to in this gap region. Okay. All right, so um, I'll pause there for a second to see if there are any questions because the rest of the talk is really gonna be sort of the technical details of how that calculation is performed. Okay. So, you know, one of the key elements in the ADS CFT dictionary relates the partition function and the quantum mechanics of the black hole. So just trace e to the minus beta h. That quantity gets related to a gravitational path integral in the ADS throat. Okay. So the left hand side, you know what it means. Trace e to the minus beta h is just familiar statistical quantity. Quantity on the right-hand side is much more confusing. It's, uh, it's very poorly understood, potentially mathematically ill-defined. The only way that physicists know how to work with this object is really in the saddle point approximation. So when we talk about the gravitational path integral, you know, what we mean is performing some integral over matter fields and metrics with prescribed asymptotics in the far region of anti sitter space. And the boundary conditions that we impose there are gonna be fixed by the ensemble, by quantities like beta and chemical potentials, fugacities, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so 
yeah. So this entry in the dictionary relates the partition function in quantum mechanics to a gravitational path integral in the throat of ADS. So we sort of fix the boundary conditions at the mouth of the throat, and then we integrate over the gravitational fluctuations right outside of the black hole. That quantity is supposed to be the same as the partition function in the quantum mechanics. Okay, so we're trying to do this functional integral, integral over metrics subject to some boundary conditions. But we, of course, don't know how to do that exactly. The only way we know how to approximate it is via saddle point. And in this case, saddle point just means solution to the Einstein equation subject to the boundary conditions. Okay. So in this case, the saddle point for this gravitational path integral uh, that we're doing for the Kerr black hole is just going to be the neck geometry. So neck is an abbreviation for near horizon extreme care. The metric is pretty simple. I've written it here. This is basically just an ADS2 factor. And, uh, and then there's just a little bit of warping on the compact uh, directions because the black hole is spinning. Okay, so this is a geometry very similar to ADS2 times S2. I think it was originally discovered by Bardeen and Horowitz. And if you use this geometry uh, as the saddle point for the gravitational path integral at zero temperature, you will get precisely the leading order Bekenstein Hawking answer. Okay, so we approximate Z grav using saddle point, get the exponential of a non-shell action, and that quantity that occurs in the exponent is just the extremal entry, okay? So that's the leading order uh, calculation. And then the uh, first correction comes from integrating over the quantum fluctuations about the saddle, okay? And that's really where all of the subtleties lot because you know in quantum field theory for instance the one loop uh, correction is always uv divergent so you're integrating over modes which can be localized at arbitrarily short distance scales there's infinitely many of them uh, so you get a divergence if we were working with an actual uv complete model of quantum gravity we would expect that this one loop uh, uh, correction was UV finite, but because we don't actually have calculational techniques that allow us to work in the full consistent uh, quantum gravity model in the neck throat, uh, we don't have that. So, so the, the approach is to sort of use low energy effective field theory, use the fields that we know are present in the throat. That means that the answer that we get will be UV divergent. Um, but there is still some universal information in the one loop correction. So part of the correction comes from short distance UV physics, as I mentioned, but part of it comes from the low energy fluctuations of massless fields. Uh, and it's known that those massless fields uh, generate universal, what are called log corrections to the entropy. So you know, I mentioned earlier that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is not an exact formula for the number of states for the black hole, right? It's sort of the leading order approximation to how many states there are. As you continue to do the gravitational path integral more and more carefully, you'll find corrections to that formula. And the, the series that you're setting up, the small parameter is basically one by S naught. So the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is a very large dimensionless number and we're going to basically do perturbation theory in one by s, right? Now, all of these correction terms, one by s, those are not universal. They depend on the actual quantum gravity model that you're working with. But it turns out that the log term is universal and that it really only depends on the low energy field content of the model, the massless fields like photons, gravitons, fermions, that sort of thing. Okay. So this correction, um, it was computed by Sen in a number of examples, starting about 
10 years ago and compared to the microscopic answers where you can also calculate a correction to the Bekenstein Hawking entry. So, uh, you know, the microscopics always comes from string theory in these examples. Uh, and in each case where you have both the microscopic model and this gravitational calculation, they were found to match. Okay. And importantly, that match was only possible for supersymmetric black holes. Uh, but we know lots of those. And in each case, uh, there was a precise match. So this is just a table from one of Sen's papers showing the different black holes where these log terms agree. Now, it, it's important that the match was only done for supersymmetric black holes because there's a very subtle piece of Sen's calculation, which turns out to be irrelevant for supersymmetric black holes, but actually crucial for non-supersymmetric black holes like Kara, for instance, okay? So the one loop uh, correction that we're calculating basically amounts to calculating a functional determinant. So if you're unfamiliar with what that means, uh, let's just recall the basic uh, Gaussian integrals. So if you're integrating e to the minus eigenvalue x squared, you get one by square root of the eigenvalue. If you have multiple Gaussian eigenvalues, you get one over the product of all of these eigenvalues, right? So doing this gravitational path integral uh, with prescribed boundary conditions means basically that we take the metrics which we integrate over, we write them as the background neck metric plus a perturbation, and then we integrate over these normalizable uh, perturbations, right? And the one loop correction just means that we expand the Einstein Hilbert action out to second order in this perturbation. So we get the saddle point answer, which is like e to the two pi j, that was the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. And then we're doing this integral over the fluctuations. We get some kinetic operator d for the perturbation. Now, d is a second order linear differential operator, so it's like an infinite dimensional matrix, basically. Uh, and if we decompose H into orthogonal eigenvectors for that infinite dimensional matrix, then you just get a product of Gaussian integrals, where this lambda up here is just related uh, to the eigenvalue of the kinetic operator, okay? So doing this one loop correction is basically just calculating a determinant of this kinetic operator that shows up in the Einstein-Hilbert action. And what Sin did was to basically extract some of the universal information from that determinant and compare it to quantum mechanics, okay? But there can be a subtlety in that calculation if this kinetic operator has zero marks, because if you're integrating a zero mode, you don't have any exponential suppression on this non-compact integration cycle, so you'll just get infinity. And it turns out that in the neck throat, uh, this kinetic operator actually has infinitely many zero modes. So you can just write them down explicitly. Here they are, they're labeled by an integer n. Uh, they're completely normalizable, which means that you're supposed to integrate over them when you do this gravitational path integral. Um, but that means that this path integral that you're doing is actually infrared divergent, okay? So that signals kind of an additional subtlety in this near extremal limit for black holes. It doesn't happen for higher dimensional black brains and their higher dimensional ADS throats is something which is particular to ADS2. Uh, and this problem, which is related to the other subtleties in the thermodynamics, which I uh, discussed earlier, has shown up in the past in a number of ways, okay? So it, the basic problem is just that the ADS2 is a low dimensional system with long range forces. And that means that because there aren't many directions for the lines of force to spread out in, um, the back reaction that you get from putting a point source anywhere in the ADS2 throat actually will become very large, very far away from uh, the source. So if you try to put 
uh, a probe or perturbation in the ADS2 throat, it'll source a gravitational field which just breaks the ADS2 asymptotics. So it's kind of a, another example of a failure to decouple from the far region because you thought that you could sort of isolate this throat region, just study perturbations in this throat region, you'd have weakly coupled gravitational dynamics. But the minute you put any finite energy excitation inside of this throat, um, you know, its effect becomes large very far away out near the boundary of ADS, and that's the region which we associate to the far region, okay? So that was a problem which was known for a while. Uh, it started to receive attention again after uh, a work by these authors in 2016. And what uh, Maldesena, Stanford, and Yang did was to identify sort of a pseudo-Goldstone boson description of this infrared divergence. And there was similar analysis done for Kerr. But basically, they identified a degree of freedom, which if you keep track of appropriately, sort of takes into account these back reaction effects and allows you to then continue doing the normal perturbation theory that you can do in higher dimensional ADS throats. Okay, so I don't want to spend too much time describing that. I just mentioned it because it's related to the subtlety and SENS calculation, you see, because these metric perturbations that I wrote down, which are zero modes of the kinetic operator in the neck throat, they're actually just large non-compact diffeomorphisms. So if you take this vector field and you take a lead derivative of the neck metric with respect to it, you will get precisely this metric perturbation up here. Uh, the point is that this diffeomorphism has non-compact support, so it acts non-trivially at the boundary of the ADS throat. So it's not something that you quotient by in the gravitational path integral. And if you look at what it does near the boundary of neck, it's doing precisely a time reparameterization at the boundary of, of the neck throat. And that's the sort of degree of freedom that Maldesena Stanford and Yang uh, were studying in the ADS2 times S2 example. Okay. Now, the issue, so the idea is that that mode is basically responsible classically for the linear and T correction to the Bekenstein Hawking entropy at extremality. Uh, but if you also treat it quantum mechanically, you'll find that it has a pretty dramatic effect on the low temperature thermodynamics. So this was all sort of put together for the Reister Nordstrom black hole and spherical symmetry uh, by these authors a little more than a year ago. And what we did was basically to adapt the analysis to Kerr. Okay, so the idea uh, in all of these papers is to rather than work at exact extremality where we have this infrared divergence and don't really know how to make sense uh, of the zero temperature partition function, we're going to instead try to work at small but finite temperature, do a calculation where we don't have the infrared divergence, and then understand what the limit would be onto the zero temperature. So at the calculational level, what that means is that when we take the normal scaling limit into the neck throat, we don't set the temperature precisely to zero, but we keep the leading in T correction to the neck metric. So this delta G, which scales linearly in temperature. Okay, so that gives you a much more complicated metric than the neck metric that I showed you earlier. It's kind of interesting that, you know, expanding the Kerr metric out in temperature gives you something actually much more complicated than the Kerr metric. But, so, is. so then, but somehow what you're doing here is different from taking the near neck limit, right? Yeah, it is, it is different. This is a geometry which is not diffeomorphic to neck. So there's another thing which people sometimes think of as finite temperature neck geometry, which is sort of a smaller Poincaré patch in, inside of global neck. This is different. This is actually, you keep a leading, you, you keep the subleading correction in the scaling limit, and that changes things like curvature and variance and, dynamics, yeah.
Originally, I thought. I see. So, so you just keep the next order temperature. in the expansion and temperature? Yeah. You just uh, don't throw but, it away. Uh, because all of these calculations use the Euclidean partition, the, the Euclidean gravitational path integral, the, the saddle point that you use is actually near neck. This. Um, This geometry here, because of this uh, minus one, for instance, this is actually the near neck Euclidean. When mm -hmm. you rotate it, you get the Euclidean near neck geometry. So you actually, you keep something different. We, we call it the not neck uh, geometry to differentiate from near neck. Okay, uh, so if you keep that metric perturbation, that induces a perturbation in the kinetic operator. And then you can just use first order perturbation theory to calculate the corrections to the eigenvalues for these zero marks. Okay. And this is really a very complicated quantity. So, you know, to give you some idea, you know, for this metric, just to store its curvature tensor, the text uh, representation takes several megabytes. So it's a very complicated geometry. And yet, after you do all of the integrals, you get something very simple. So you just find that the eigenvalues of these zero modes get a shift which is linear in temperature and controlled by the mode number n. And so once you have that, uh, then you can use these eigenvalues at finite temperature to compute the one loop determinant. You'll get something finite. There's a standard way uh, to regularize uh, using zeta functions. So what's happening is that you put in a finite temperature and that basically regulated this infrared divergence in some sense because finite temperature makes the length of the neck throat finite. So you lose the infrared divergence, you get a finite answer. Uh, but there turns out to be a lot of physics uh, in this simple correction to the partition function because what it means now, so basically you're getting a t to the three halves prefactor in front of the leading calculation to the gravitational path integral. And that means that as you take the temperature to be small, the partition function is itself becoming small rather than staying exponentially large. So the previous leading order calculation that doesn't have this t to the three halves says that as you take t to zero, z just goes like e to the s. And that's just some huge number and as previously interpreted as the huge ground state degeneracy for the care black hole. But now you see that you calculate the one loop correction to this answer. And we knew that we needed that correction because of this old work by Trivedi, Wilczek, and, and others. And the effect of that uh, correction is actually to remove this huge ground state degeneracy. The partition function becomes small at low temperature, we don't have a lot of ground states. Instead, those states, which we thought were all sitting at zero energy, they get spread out into a very dense energy band right above the vacuum, okay? So that's sort of the qualitative uh, physical picture for what's happening. Uh, you know, we can't really say, you know, we know there's not e to the s number of states at zero energy. To say more, you actually would need to be resolving sort of the eigenvalue spacings in between these individual states, we expect those to be like e to the minus s, which is a non-perturbative effect in gravity. So that's something which we really have no hope of ever calculating, but we think we understand the physical picture well enough. So there's not gonna be a huge ground state degeneracy. There's a dense energy band above the vacuum where all of those states uh, fill out. Uh, and then you can still apply thermodynamics into that energy band above the vacuum. <clears throat> okay. So the last thing that I want to wrap up with is just when can you trust the result of this calculation? So obviously, you know, once this temperature dependent correction starts competing with e to the s naught, then the calculation breaks down. Because at that point, the partition function is becoming so small that we would have needed to also have kept track of non-perturbative corrections in the gravitational path integral because those 
will be just as large as this tiny number here, okay? So for exponentially small temperatures, uh, we don't trust this result. Um, and similarly, for high enough temperatures, the neck approximation to the dynamics just breaks down. So the, you know, the correction term to the neck metric becomes larger than the neck metric everywhere in the throat. And so it's just the small temperature expansion itself breaks down. Okay, so there's sort of an upper bound set by the spin of the black hole and a lower bound, which is uh, exponential in the entropy. But everywhere inside of that band, we expect that this is sort of the dominant effect for the partition function. And what's important is just that in this range, the partition function is becoming small rather than leveling off to this huge uh, e to the s. Okay, so that, that's the main result of, uh, of the paper. But there are several things I think left to, to try to understand. The most important one is just that black holes in asymptotically flat space, uh, their resonances, so they have finite lifetimes and they're not eigenstates. So, you know, for supersymmetric black holes or Reissner and Nordstrom black holes with certain matter content, you can make their lifetime, you know, sort of exponentially long in the entropy, but care black holes have super radiant instability, which is sort of another source of non-decoupling, and that causes the black hole to spin down and gradually decay into the flat region. So we didn't do the integral over the super radiant modes. That's going to have another important effect because it sort of controls the decay rate of the black hole. So these sort of eigenvalues that we're talking about in all of those plots, they really have finite widths, and those widths are supposed to be controlled by super radiance. And I think it would be interesting to try to understand that quantitatively. And I think it would also be very interesting to try to um, reproduce this t to the three halves behavior, not just using the neck geometry to do the gravitational path integral, but to do it using the full care geometry, just so that you know there's no funny business uh, you know, in matching the throat region onto the far region you know, some people worry that these modes are, you know, they look like pure diffeomorphisms. So what if you're not actually supposed to integrate over them in the full black hole geometry since you've artificially introduced this boundary at the ADS uh, throat part of the geometry? Um, so I think that's something which probably is much more technically involved, but it would be an interesting check on, on all of these papers. So I'll... Um, Looks like I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to stop there and just uh, end for questions. Thanks, Dan, for a very interesting talk. Yeah. Um, any questions, please? Maybe I maybe I'll start with uh so about the matching to the far region. Um so uh, so I mean do, do you have in mind a match asymptotic expansion kind of matching kind of taking your calculation but then matching these boundary conditions that you prescribed for the near region and no, matching that? I think that's you know. That would be one way to do it, but I think people will still worry that maybe that there's something a little bit subtle going on. What I'd like to do- Starting with the curve from, from the get-go? Take, take curve and pose the normal finite temperature boundary condition that spatial infinity and try to see this T to the three halves behavior from the one loop contribution, the full near extremal curve partition function. Um, and I think it should be possible because we kind of know that this piece of the answer is coming from like a localized geometric region. So we know that if we get this answer is going to come from the throat region in some 
in some way. Um, you know, and they, you know, the solutions to the wave equation in the near extremal care geometry actually do kind of bifurcate in an interesting way into the solutions which have support kind of far from the black hole and the ones which have most of their support inside of the throat. So there's like this, in the quasi normal mode story. Like that. There's this, yeah. this set of yeah. modes which have very long lifetimes and real part right near the super radiant frequency. And they basically bounce around in the throat for a very long time. That's why they have a long lifetime. And the, the energy in neck is basically deviation from the super radiant frequency, right? So those modes, they kind of look like zero modes in the throat because the imaginary part is almost zero and the real part is almost zero, right? Um, so, you know, when you're doing the determinant in the full care geometry, it seems like it should be possible to separate those out you know, understand their effect on the determinant and see if you can get the two of the three halves from them. Because the rest is not doing anything interesting in the near extremal limit, right? The rest of the geometry looks approximately just like a normal curve black hole. It's really the waves that get localized near the horizon, which should do this. So I think I think there should be some like nice and relatively simple way to manipulate the full care determine that you of course can't calculate the whole thing, but maybe you have analytic control over this piece. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that that would be a very interesting direction. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Okay, if not, then let's thank Dan again. Thanks. Uh, close the recording. <coughs> oh, okay. How do I do that? Here.